So, mentoring is something that has played a monumental and notable part in my life today. I'm a product of it. It's something that has helped shape what otherwise would have been an opaque future for myself. To gain a better understanding, I feel like it's fitting for me to share just a little bit of my story so that you guys can see just how much the power of mentoring has had in my life today. So for me to tell this story, I guess I have to rewind the clock to East London onto a council estate. So I grew up in a council estate in East London with my mum, my sister, and my dad. My dad for some parts of my life because he unfortunately left us, so it was just me, my mum, and my sister. And growing up, we didn't have much money at home. My mum didn't earn much, and she had to look after three, sometimes four people at a time. Unfortunately, both my parents were also addicted to alcohol. My dad more so than my mum. So growing up, I saw a lot of confrontations at home. I saw a lot of arguments at home. And I didn't like to stay at home much. So when I went to school, I would go home. From home, I'd go straight back outside. And I was always playing outside. I was playing with people my age. When they had to go home because they had a curfew, I'd go and play with the older guys. And playing outside constantly, I discovered that I had a talent, which was football. And then it all clicked. I was going to use football as an avenue to create a better life for my family. So that if I do have kids in the future, then they wouldn't have to go through the same struggles that I went through. So I guess from a young age, I was fairly focused. I didn't get involved in the usual smoking, drinking, and drugs that people my age were doing. And from a young age, I also started playing football at quite a high level. I started playing at youth professional and then youth semi-professional level. But one thing I saw when I was growing up, which at the time I didn't know why, was that I was always looking for male guidance. I was always looking for a male role model, and I don't know why I was looking for that. I was looking for someone that would provide me with guidance, someone I could seek advice from, someone that could almost whip me to shape when I was doing something wrong. I don't know why, as a young person, I was seeking that. So, it's almost like because I didn't have that at home, I started to look for it outside. Started to get involved in the local gangs in the area, hanging around with these guys. I was a bit smarter than them because I knew that I had a potential football career. So whatever they were doing, I wouldn't do it to that extent. Started to get involved in mischief, started to get involved in confrontations, causing mayhem and bringing trouble to my door. From a young age, I got excluded from school. My mum had to pick me up from a police station. The policeman looked at me and said, Reggie, don't do it again. But my mum looked at me with a big face of disappointment. My mum had to work one, two jobs at a time just to provide for the household, and it's almost like I spat it back in her face. So from that moment, I said, you know what? I'm going to change. And I wanted to change. I started to hang around with my friends less. And just so that you guys have an idea, I stand here before you today. I've lost three of my friends due to knife and gun crime, and over two handful of my friends have gone to prison at least once. So it was a statistic that I was never running away from if I continued in that environment. So I started to focus more. And things were going well. I was never the academic type, so I didn't really take my education seriously. However, I managed to pass all my GCSEs except for science. I got Bs and Cs across the board, and I was happy with that because I didn't take it seriously and I still passed. At that time as well, I signed a two-year football contract. So I was living in London, traveling outside London to play football and study. So things were going well. Also at this point, my dad came back to live with us. And it, it could have been very easy for me to have a grudge against him. Why did you leave? So many questions that I had when I was looking for that male role model, that guidance, it could have been him, but instead I had to look for it other, in other places. But I didn't. I didn't say that. I decided to almost try and build that relationship again because even as a young man, and even though I didn't know why, I was still looking for a male role model, someone that could provide me with that guidance, someone that I could look up to and say, you know what, I want to be like you. So I thought I can find that in my dad. When I was 17 years old, my dad woke up and he felt ill. 
My mum said, oh, no, Reggie, you can go. It's probably just his diabetes playing up. The next day, I went to college. And I was at training that day. My dad was admitted into hospital. I was going to go see him after college because I thought it was just his diabetes playing up, nothing serious. I called my mum and I said, mum, I'm going to go see, see dad. She said, no, come home first. I went home. I said, my mum was sitting there. She sat me down. And she said that your dad's unfortunately passed away. He passed away because of the alcohol abuse. See, it wasn't a routine diabetic check. He was admitted to hospital and went straight into a coma because his internal organs failed. So I had that male role model again, but I lost it straight away. And that event led me to almost think outside the box. That event was something that was a great catalyst to what happens next. I decided to stop playing football. And the reason why I decided to stop playing football is because I was almost seen as a, as a first generation wealth builder. My family didn't depend on me, but they saw me as someone that could provide a better life, not just for our immediate household, but also for the generation to come. And I saw football as very risky for myself. So I decided to stop playing football and try and seek something a bit more long term. And at this point in time as well, because I wanted to change, my friend invited me to church. And I remember I heard something that said, if you want to see different results, you have to come out your comfort zone. And that's something that resonated with me greatly. I also watched a TV program, an American TV program. And I gained inspiration from that as well. And I put these two together. And an idea came to mind, and an innovative idea came to mind. And it was this idea that would ultimately change the course of my serendipity forever. I decided to Google and to type in Google wealthiest areas in London and find out what area was the richest area. I wanted to find this out because I wanted to find out what the wealthy did to amass their wealth. There must have been a secret somewhere. I just had to find it. So when I found out the richest areas in London, I made a list of them and I went to one of them, which was Kensington and Chelsea. I went there and I started asking random people in the streets, what did you do to amass your wealth? What skills do you have that I can take for myself, use it, go back to where I'm from an accountant estate and one day become as wealthy as you? I was in the area for about three hours. People weren't stopping in the street, so I decided to knock on people's doors. When I knocked on the doors, I knocked on the door of, at the time, a senior executive for the largest asset management company on the planet. When I knocked on the door, to my surprise, they invited me in. When they invited me in, they started to speak to me. And I started to open up to them like never before. I started to talk to them about my education career, how I'm not academically bright and I don't really care about education. How I was on a football contract, but now I don't really want to play football and I don't really care about football anymore. How my father has just passed away. How we don't really have money growing up. Yes, my mum tried extremely hard, and she's the most hard-working person I've ever met. And we, we got by. Don't get me wrong, we got by. We had food in the fridge, and we had clothes on our backs. We, we did okay, but we still struggled to an extent. And I guess I told this story just so that you guys can see what happens next and how much of an impact the power of mentoring can have. So when I met this guy, his name was Quinton Price. He provided me with three things, three things that will change the course of my life forever. And the first thing he provided me with was visibility. You see, when I met him, he invited me to the company two weeks later, and I spent an insight day there. I went there for an insight day, and I kid you not, my tie was so short, I didn't know how to wear a suit. I went in there, I looked a mess. I even wore fake glasses because I thought smart people had to wear glasses. <laughs> I didn't know what to do. I had never been in that environment before. But he provided me with visibility. Visibility being, Reggie, whatever you want to do, you can actually do it. And I know it sounds quite cliche, but where I'm from, you don't hear that. Where I'm from, you're, you're presented with three options. Football, crime, or music. I was never going to be a musician. I tried football and it didn't work, and my mum wouldn't let me become a criminal. So I exploited all my options. 
I exploited all my options. And seeing Quinton and meeting Quinton, my mentor, he provided me with the visibility that I can do anything I want to do. The next thing that he provided me with was guidance. You see, after that insight day, I did a week-long work experience. And on my work experience, he invited me afterwards to have a meeting with my mum and another guy called Nathan Higgins. We went into this boardroom type room, and he was congratulating me for getting through the week and just for congratulating me in terms of how far I've come so far. He said to me, Reggie, if you do want to work in the financial services, he would encourage me to go to university. He didn't force me to, but he would encourage me to. When I heard those words, it was almost like my heart dropped because I didn't want to study again. I didn't care about education. I didn't know where my academic strengths were. I didn't know if I was good at maths, English, or science. Well, definitely not science, but I didn't know if I was good at maths or English. I didn't know or care about education. So when he said to me that he would encourage me to go to university, I had to think about it, but in the end, I did. And with that guidance, I managed to enroll into university. I studied economics and Mandarin at university. And over the three years at university, I managed to complete five internships at various hedge funds and asset managers in the city of London. That was just through guidance. And the last thing that he provided me with, and I say that this is a combination between visibility and guidance, was hope. Three months into my university career, I had an exam. And that exam, I actually tried. I went to university with a different mindset. I said, I'm going to go to university, and I'm going to do the best that I can, and hopefully get a good grade, and get a good job, et cetera, et cetera. Three months in, I had my first exam, and I failed miserably. I got 25%. For those that don't know what 25% is, it is a U. It is a fail. It is ungradable. And when I received that grade, I remember I got in contact with my mentor, and I didn't tell him what grade I got, but I told him that I'm finding university very difficult. I'm actually trying, and it's not working. And I was ready to pack it all in. I was ready to say thank you for your guidance, but university is not for me. But one thing that he showed me was that if I did stick this out, then what was at the end was a lot greater than what I was going through at that moment. Just to give you an idea, and before I say this, it's not about the money, but it's about creating a better lifestyle. He showed me that at the end of this, what I could potentially earn was more than my household income combined. So seeing that and having that visibility. Next exam, three months later, I scored 84%. Exam after that, I scored 86%. For those that don't know, it's an A. <laughs> and I started to score first classes and two ones, and I started to do well at university. And in the end, I graduated from university with a 2-1 in economics, something that I thought was impossible. You see, mentoring, it doesn't have to be tangible. Mentoring isn't tangible, it's invaluable. And because of the visibility, because of the guidance and the hope, I've gone on to do some humbling and amazing things with companies and organizations which I otherwise wouldn't think of partnering up with or collaborating with, with the likes of Downing Street, Bloomberg, ITV, BBC, Steve Harvey, House of Lords, and many other amazing organizations and institutions. So I guess if you guys gain anything from what I've said today, it is that mentoring can be such a powerful thing and can change the course of someone's life forever. I'll be the first person to put my hand up and say, I am not better than anyone else. I am never going to be the smartest in the room. I am not someone that will hold my hand up and say, I'm amazing. Far from, very far from. And whenever I see anyone from my estate or when I see someone that is young misbehaving, my first question isn't, what are you doing? My first question is, what can I be doing to help that person? Because having been on both sides of the fence, I know what it's like to have no one to look up to. And I know what it's like when you have someone that you can look up to and that can provide you with visibility, guidance, and hope. So please, if you guys do gain anything from this, provide these three things for someone else. And if you are on the other side that I was on, 
then just know that the hardest moments create your best stories. Thank you.